Well, good day to you whenever you're watching this. It's uh, kind of a not necessarily rainy morning right now, but we're expecting some rain today. Had a little yesterday, so it's uh, we need rain. It's a good thing in the spring to get some good rain wherever you are. I hope the weather is good for you, and thank you for joining us for our Bible study. We are in the 119th Psalm, where we've been now for... Um, several months. We'll continue to be here for a little while. We are right in the middle of this uh, wonderful chapter. There are 22 sections. This is the 11th of those 22 sections that we'll deal with today. So after our Bible study today, we're halfway through the 119th Psalm. Uh, We just shared some prayer requests. Perhaps you have some as well. Let's go to the Lord and just uh, cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for being here for us and with us, and thank you, Lord, for hearing our hearts' uh, concerns, our cries to you. Thank you, Lord, for the most simple prayers that we offer when we call out to you and we really don't even know uh, what, we, what we need, but we, we know that we have a need. And so, Lord, we ask that you would hear our prayers. We've lifted up many today that are in hospitals, others that are, have been transferred to some end-of-life facilities. We pray for them and for their families. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are shut-ins that can't get out and enjoy things like they once did. I thank you for these that have gotten out on a a kind of a cloudy, overcast, wet Wednesday morning to be a part of a Bible study together. And I thank you for the group that will come tonight to be a part of that. And I pray, Lord, your blessings upon our church. Thank you for the way you have just opened the windows of heaven and poured out blessings on us in recent days. And we don't take that for granted. Thank you for the... Uh, the many, many people we've seen baptized in recent weeks. Thank you, Lord, for the way you have blessed us with ministry opportunities. Thank you for the new people that you're sending to our congregation and the people that we're seeing uh, have their lives changed. Thank you for the financial blessings that you've poured out on us. Lord, for everything you've done, we say thank you. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. So, Lord, we come to you again, and we ask you to take your word and open it to us. There's something in this passage that every person sitting here, every person listening to this Bible study online, there's something that every person needs to hear. And in, in, in the sovereignty of God, it may be different for every person, but I pray that as we listen, that we will each hear this, the singular word that we need to hear, the thing that will encourage us and help us today. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray that you would use it to speak to each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are today, as I just said, in the 11th section of these 22 sections of the 119th Psalm. You know very well by now that there are 22 sections because there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and each one of these letters uh, has a section, and in each section, whatever the corresponding letter is, every line in the Hebrew language, not in English, but every line of that section begins with that letter. It was a very poetic way that the psalmist did this. It's not the only place in the Bible that we have this pattern, but it is It is uh, the most prominent, and it is the most beautiful out of all of them, and certainly it is the longest. There are 176 verses in this chapter. There are 22 sections. Each section has eight verses, so uh, uh, 22 times 8 equal 176. Uh, So we are right in the middle of it. We're at the 11th section today, and it is the Kof section, the letter Kof. Uh, it's spelled here in my translation, K-A-F. A lot of times you'll see it tra- uh, spelled K-A-P-H, but the pronunciation would be the same either way. Now, the theme of this little section, these eight verses, the theme is that we all are going to have afflictions. They come at us in different waves, and they come at us at different levels, but we're all going to have afflictions But through the afflictions of life, God can strengthen us and that God can revive us through his word. I've said to you many times now that virtually every verse, almost every verse of the 176 verses has some reference to the word of God. Now, this section has one of the few exceptions to that. There is one verse in this section that does not have a synonym for the Word of God in it. It's very unusual. There are only a couple. Some uh, commentary writers, particularly some of the old rabbinic scholars, say that this is the only verse 
that does not have any reference to the Word of God. M most other translators say, well, there, there, there are a couple, but without any question, th this is one of the very, very, very few verses out of the 176 that does not have a reference. Let me show you the different synonyms that are there for God's Word. In verse 81, your word. Verse 82, you promised, so your promises. Verse 83, your statutes. Verse 84 does not have a reference to the Word of God. Now, it does refer to God's judgments, but the context of it, uh, there are many, many verses in these 176 that, that judgments, your judgments is a reference to God's Word, but not in this verse. It's not a reference to your judgments as the Word of God, but rather the, the judgment that God is going to execute. Verse 85, your instruction. Verse 86, your commands. Verse 87, your precepts. And verse 88, your decrees. So it's verse 84 that uh, is one of the very few that does not have a synonym in it or a reference in it to God's word. It's a beautiful passage here that deals with affliction. Let's deal with it two verses at a time today. I'll read the couple of verses and then we'll talk about them. I long for your salvation. I put my hope in your word. My eyes grow weary looking for what you have promised. I ask, when will you comfort me? Now, there's a lot in those two verses. He starts off by saying, I long for your salvation. The idea of longing here is uh, some translations use the word faint. I faint. Uh, it's an idea of trouble. It's an idea of affliction. It's an idea of being overcome and exhausted, being worn down. I long for your salvation. It's the picture of collapsing and uh, not really knowing where to turn when trouble comes our way. Now, Paul wrote about that over in uh, one of the letters to the Corinthians in the, uh, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, Paul wrote, we are pressured in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Now that's really what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and what the psalmist says in chapter 119 is really the same idea. It's, it's, an, it's the thought of you just feeling like the weight of the world is on you. And you have, you've been there, right? You've been there. You may be there now, some of you. But we've all walked through that valley of, of despondency to the point where we just feel like we are crushed. Now, you can't read that phrase, I long for your salvation, I, I, I faint. It, it, it's the picture of the loss of strength. You can't read that without hearing the desperation in his voice. But even in the desperation, what I want you to realize as we move down through this, there's desperation, but he's not despairing. And that seems to be a contradiction, doesn't it? But I think that's the reality of it. There's desperation and at the point is that, that he's in his life, but he is not despairing because God has seen him through many other situations and he just believes that God is going to see him through this situation as well. He is trusting the Lord to take care of whatever this problem is that he's dealing with. And also notice in that first phrase, he says, I long for your salvation. The normal way we would say that is my salvation. I'm looking for you to save me. But he turns it to the Lord. Lord, I'm looking for your, you're the one that's going to have to do this. You're the one that's going to have to help me. You're the one that's going to have to give me strength. So Lord, I, I'm, I'm fainting. I'm, I'm feeling desperate. I'm, I'm losing my strength. I long for your salvation. But look at the second phrase there in verse 81. You, you could put the word but before the second phrase because it's a contrast. I long for your salvation. I put my hope in your word. I put my hope in your word. Now there's that word hope again. Um, hope is not a wish. You know, I hope it doesn't rain this afternoon while I'm doing something that I need to do outside. That's not it at all. It's an expectation. I put my hope in you. Uh, the New Testament talks a, a lot about that 
hope that is ours. Uh, First Thessalonians, Paul wrote, we recall in the presence of our God and Father, your work of faith, labor of love, and endurance of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And in the fifth chapter of First Thessalonians, Paul wrote about hope this way. He said, but since we are of the day, we must be sober and put on the armor of faith and love on our chest and put on a helmet of the hope of our salvation. That's an interesting picture, that we cover our mind, we cover our heart with, our chest with faith, we cover our mind with hope, that we do not, even even when we're in a difficult situation, we do not despair, we put our hope in his word. Uh, You know, there are a lot of things that should point us to the word of God. One of the things really is just, uh, I don't know that curiosity is the best word to use, but a desire, maybe not curiosity, but a desire to know God. Why do we dig into God's word? Well, we want to know what God's word says. We want to know what God is saying to us. But one of the great motivators to really dig into God's word is affliction. And affliction can either push someone away from the Lord or draw someone to the Lord. And the psalmist says, when I've come to this great point of affliction in my life, I'm putting my hope in your word. I'm, I'm going to dig into your word. And look at what the way he says it in verse 82. My eyes grow weary looking for what you have promised. He is searching God's word for those promises to the point where, have you ever, I know you have, you, you stayed up late, you've had a long day, you're trying to read something and your eyes start to burn and, and they, they just feel like they're, they're dried out. That's a picture of what the psalmist is saying. I, I, my eyes have grown weary. They're burning. I'm searching out your word for your promises because I need this hope. I need this hope that the affliction that's, that, that's uh, afflicting me right now, this problem that I'm dealing with, that it is not going to defeat me. My eyes have grown weary looking for what you have promised. And I ask, when will you comfort me? Now, he's going to use that word when twice. He'll use it again down in verse 84. And we've all been there, Lord. I've been calling out to you. When are you going to answer this prayer? I've been seeking you. When are you going to... Do what you've promised to do. We all feel that way sometimes just about life around us. We see culture and what's happening in the world around us, and we say, how long, Lord? How long are you going to let this go on? Which is another way of saying, when are you going to right the wrong? When are you going to end the lunacy of the the, the world that we're living in, Lord? When when are are your promises going to be true? That's what he says here. I've, I've been looking for what you've promised. I ask, when will you comfort me? Um, Charles Spurgeon wrote a lot of commentaries. Uh, One of his great commentaries is on Psalm 119. But he also preached a lot of sermons out of these passages. And one of the sermons that he preached out of this section of Psalm 119 was really about God's timing for our comfort. When will God comfort us? It's an interesting sermon thought. When will God comfort us? Well, when we repent of sin, when we trust him, when we obey him, when we really uh, stop trying to fix all of our problems on our own and we we just trust God's word. The the sermon was basically answering the question, when God, when will you do this? Here's here's one thing I want you to take out of that first section there, those first two verses. Don't wait for the pain to leave your life before you Uh, turn to the Lord. Turn to the Lord in the midst of the pain. Turn to the Lord in his promises while you're in the conflict, and he will bring comfort to you in the pain. Some people think that when this pain is over, then I'll know that the Lord did what he promised he would do, and I'll turn to the Lord. Turn to the Lord in the pain, and he will bring you comfort. So those are the first two verses. Let's look at the next two, verse 83 and 84. Though I have become like a wineskin dried by smoke, do not forget your statutes. How many days must your servant wait? When will you execute judgment on my persecutors? Now that first line there, verse 83, is a picture that you and I don't get. It's out of our cultural understanding, but they got it very well. You know that the wineskins were used 
to, to make what they would have used as a water bottle or a wine bottle. Uh, uh, we have plastic and we have glass. They had wine skins. Wine skins were these um, containers that were made out of the leather, the skin of an animal. Now, because it contained a liquid, it had to remain supple. It couldn't get dried out. If it became dried out, it would be brittle, it would crack, it would have holes in the cracks, and it wouldn't be good for its purpose of holding whatever liquid was in it. So uh, these wineskins were very important to them. But if someone took a wineskin and inadvertently, they would have been careful about this, they're, they're, they're very valuable to them, but if someone had inadvertently put a wineskin beside a fire, uh, maybe they hung it uh, out one night, you know, they're out uh, traveling and so they're spending the night and they hang a wine skin in, uh, on a limb of a tree and then someone builds a fire close to it and, and the heat from the fire or the smoke from the fire hits the wine skin and it begins to dry it out. That's the picture that the psalmist uses of himself. He says, I'm like a wine skin that's been put above a fire. And, and I've become brittle and dry and I'm, I'm not going to be able to serve the purpose for which I'm created. I've become like a wineskin dried by smoke. But then the end of verse 83 is a contrast. You could put the word but or you could put the word yet. Though I've become like a, a wineskin dried by smoke, but I do not forget your statutes. Lord, I'm not going to forget your word. I'm not going to forget that you've been there with me and that, that you've, you've taken care of me before and that you'll take care of me now. I will not forget your statutes. It becomes real easy when we have trouble in life to get distracted and we start looking at the trouble. And in this case, it's the trouble is coming from somebody. Some person is causing the psalmist problem and it's easy to become distracted and look at the problem or the person who's causing the problem and get your eyes off God. And what the psalmist is saying to us is that when we are going through the afflictions, don't let the distractions get our eyes on whatever the problem is and whoever the problem is and take our eyes off you. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on you. You're the solution to the problem. You're the one who has given us the promises and you're the one that we can trust. So I will not forget your statutes. How many days, verse 84? And again, this is the one verse that does not specifically refer, refer to God's word. How many days must your servant wait? When, there's the word again, he used the word in verse 82, uses it here in 84. When will you execute judgment on my persecutors? When will you execute judgment on my persecutors? persecutors. He is trusting the Lord to do that. He is desperate for it to happen, but he, he, he doesn't know when God is going to answer this prayer. Verse 85, 86, let's read the two together. The arrogant have dug pits for me. They violate your instruction. All your commands are true. People persecute me with lies. Help me. Now, verse 85, it refers back really to something back in Exodus 21. Let me read it for you. When it says they have, um, they have abandoned or they have uh, violated your commandments, what commandments is it talking about? Well, this is in Exodus chapter 21, and I'm reading from verse 33. It says, when a man uncovers a pit or digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit must give compensation. He must pay money to its owner, but the dead animal will become his. Now, it's, it's almost as though the psalmist is, is drawing a picture here that just like someone in those days would hunt an animal by digging a pit, they didn't have guns to go out and hunt an animal with a gun, they would dig a pit and, and trap an animal that way. That's the picture that he's painting of what his enemy has done to him. An enemy has dug a pit, has set a trap for him, and he's fallen into it. He's using that as a picture that they would have understood. And he says, they violated your commandments. You said that a person that, that, that does that is responsible. They've got to pay for what they've done. They, they, they have violated your commandments. Verse 86, all your commands are true. Now, you need to underline the word all. Circle it. 
Put a little asterisk beside it. All your commandments are true. Not just some of God's commandments are true. All of God's commandments are true. People persecute me with lies. Now, this keeps running through this psalm, doesn't it? I mean, we've seen this. We're in the 11th section, and we've seen this in multiple sections where somebody has done something to this psalmist. This, we don't know who wrote this particular psalm, but someone has done something and told some serious lies about this person, and it, it just it's a thread that keeps weaving through this. They have persecuted me with lies. And look at the last phrase there in verse 86. Two words in my translation. Yours may be a little bit different. Help me. You know, that may be one of the most simple yet profound prayers ever prayed. And it may be one of the most often prayers ever prayed. I think sometimes when we think about prayer, we think prayer's got to be in some kind of flowery language, you know, King James words. Always tickled me even when I was a little boy. Um, I was in a small church, you know, just there weren't a lot of people there, so you knew everybody. And it, it always intrigued me, even as a boy, how I, I knew a man's voice. I knew how he talked. But when the preacher called on him to pray in church, his voice changed. And he, he used words that he never used any other time. And this, this was a wrong thing to do. We should have been listening and not thinking this way. But we used to sit on the back row and... There was one particular gentleman that when the preacher called on him to pray, there was a phrase that he used in his prayer a lot. And we would count how many times he would use that particular phrase in his prayer. And we weren't really listening to the prayer as much as we were counting how many times he said it. That became a game for the boys to, to, to think about. Sometimes we think these, you know, our prayers have to be eloquent and they have to be fancy words and King James English and we change our voice to speak like we're speaking an authoritative voice to God. Maybe the most simple prayer in the whole world is just help me. Help me, Lord, help me. I, I don't know what to say. I, I, I don't know what to do. Help me. Now here's the psalmist. I don't think this is a man who's at a loss for words. There are 176 verses in this chapter. I haven't counted how many words are in this chapter, but the man is not at a loss for words. But when he comes to this point of his prayer, all he can say is, help me. It may be the most sincere prayer that we can ever pray. Well, let's look at the last two verses there. They almost ended my life on earth, but I did not abandon your precepts. Give me life in accordance with your faithful love, and I will obey the decree you have spoken. Well, verse 87 has a lot of really great words in it, but one word that's terrific is the word almost, almost. They almost killed me. That's what he says, literally, they almost ended my life. They almost killed me. They did everything they could. And, and don't just think in terms here, as you're reading through all of these sections of the 119th Psalm, don't just think in terms of physical things. It could be physical, but it could have been an emotional thing. It, it, it could have been a spiritual battle. You know, there's a spiritual warfare that goes on. It could have been in his heart as much as just a, a, a physical problem that somebody was causing him. It, it, it very well could have been both. They almost killed me, but I did not abandon your precepts. I did not give up on what you've promised. I am clinging to, in the good times and in the bad times, I am clinging, clinging to your word because your word is truth. And then he says in verse 88, he concludes this section with this, give me. Now, if you have, I think, the King James Version. Anybody in here have a King James Version with you? I think it translates it, revive me. Revive me, the word for revival. My translation says, give me, revive me in accordance. Now, notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, revive me in accordance with my goodness. Revive me in accordance with my obedience to you. Revive me in, in a reward for what I've done for you. He says, revive me or give me life in accordance with your faithful love. He turns it back to the Lord. 
And that phrase, you've heard me say this now dozens of times, <laughs> that phrase, your faithful love, is that Hebrew word hesed, tender mercy, grace, faithfulness of God. Give me life in accordance with your faithful love, and I will obey the decree you have spoken. I, have, I will obey what has come out of your mouth. That, that phrase, what you have spoken, what's come out of your mouth, is a reminder to me of the, of the um, validity that it's God who has spoken his word. Men wrote it down. Men's personalities are in what we have here, but the spoken word of God, it's the testimony that has come out of the mouth of God. It is a reminder to me of the authority of scripture. It is what has come from the mouth of God. He says, if you will give me life, if you will revive me in accordance with your faithful love, I will obey the decree you have spoken. What's the purpose of revival? I think sometimes people talk a lot about revival these days and you know, people get excited about it. We're, we're gonna have a revival in America, revival's coming. And revival almost in the minds of some seems to be a time of excitement and, and just energy and, and God's doing this really cool thing and it's gonna get us all uh, worked up and, and all on fire for the Lord. And uh, that's kind of a picture of revival and I'm for that. You are too. I'm for that. I want to see revival come to our land. But he ends this passage by saying that the result of revival, this renewing, this awakening that he's talking about in his life, the result of revival ought to be that we obey God. We saw just not too many months ago um, revival that took place up at a college campus in Kentucky. It was one much like had happened 50 years ago in the 70s, uh, another revival that swept through that started there at Asbury. That has spread to other college campuses. I saw reports from the University of Tennessee with hundreds of students making commitments to the Lord in a revival service. I've seen it at Auburn and Alabama and uh, virtually every major college campus across the country has talked about revival. But what's the real in result to know that revival truly has happened. As important as it is to see those 18, 19, 20 year old students baptized, as important as it is to see pictures of hundreds of students gathered in these community groups on college campuses, as encouraging as that is to all of us, what's the end result that really proves that there's been revival? It is that we obey what God's word says to do. What's the old saying? It's not how high you jump. It's how straight you walk when you come down. The real result of revival and renewal, awaken me, awaken in me, the real result of that should be that we obey the Lord, that we live out our faith every day. It's another great passage. The heart of this passage is that through afflictions, through the troubles and the problems of life that we trust in the Lord and that he renews us and brings us strength. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. Good to see you all here. Enjoy the day. Let me pray for you before we go. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your wonderful word and thank you for speaking to each of us today from it. In Jesus' name, amen.